Well, good morning. Good, morning. good Sunday morning to everyone here and to everyone on the other side. Welcome in to the house of the Lord for the sermon titled Impossible. Yes, it was. Our scripture lesson today comes from Matthew 27, verse 50, to Matthew 28, verse 10. Got in trouble at breakfast. I was acting up. Wendy, me, and the boys. And I was doing breakfast puns. And Wendy said, I've had enough of it. And I looked at her for a moment. And I said, do you mean if I don't stop, I'll be toast? (laughs) And she got madder. And I said, but look, the boys are egging me on. Because I'm such a ham. She got up and left the breakfast table just like that. Matthew chapter 27, starting in the 50th verse. And When Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, He gave up the Spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding, Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened. They were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his need. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and Mary the, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priest and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said after three days, I will rise again. So he gave the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he had been raised from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Mary said to the, the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then quickly and go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him and clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. 
May God add His blessings to these passages as we seek Him out in prayer and pray for His message. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, strengthen us today. Open our hearts and our minds and set aside everything else that we may hear this message that You have given us today. We thank You, Father, that we are able to proclaim Your Son risen on this day. We thank You, Father, that Your Son did rise. We ask that You bless us through this. In His name we pray. And all of His children said, Amen. You'll flat out die. That's it. There's no, it's impossible. You'll die. It will cause terrors of the mind, ailments of the stomach. There's no need to go any faster. And it would be possible to think any quicker than that. That's just not necessary. You will flat out die. If you use, as was stated in 1858, the telegraph, it's impossible to need to go any faster. And yet, people were told that this device was creating or would create an entire race of humans that would be able to hear better with the left ear than the right ear. They would create a race of left hearing beings only over time because of this device. In 1904, it is impossible to think that this device will be used for any good. It is impossible to think that we would ever need such a foolish, foolish invention. And yet it is impossible now to think could we have ever lived without a telephone. How about is it more impossible that you would think that in, let's say, if you graduated high school in 1957 or 67 or anywhere along there, or even when you graduated high school in the 80s, that you would one day decide, I'd like to call and order a rack of ribs and reach into your coat pocket and just pull out your cell phone from anywhere in the world. It's impossible. <laughs> yes, it was. Charles Brady King was a brilliant inventor, an incredible designer, and with a thirst for knowledge, he decided that he would build his own gasoline-powered automobile. And so in 1896, he was written up and stopped by the police in Detroit, in the city where he lived, because he was going to hurt people at the breakneck speed that he was traveling. Papers carried the report the next day and said, you'll never be able to travel at this speed. People will get hurt. People will die if you go over speed of 20 miles an hour in an automobile. How many people in this room went over 20 miles an hour at some point today? 16. How many of them went over 50? Right. How many of you went over the speed limit today? I had something in my eye. <laughs> but my favorite impossibility. Critics of early steam spewing locomotives said that women's bodies were not designed to go 50 miles an hour that the bodies would fly apart and be unable to bear children. They were worried that the bodies were not set up to be accelerated to that kind of speed. Others suspected that anywhere past 50 miles an hour, the human body would simply melt, while others conjectured that the body would suffer convulsions and pain and that the mind would see bizarre things and people would go insane all because they would be traveling faster than 50 miles an hour on a steam-spewing locomotive so reckoned in 1810. Seems funny, doesn't it? When we think about all the things that are impossible, and yet the possible happened. The SR-71 was the world's fastest and high-flying air-breathing operational manned 
aircraft. It set a record in 1976 where it broke an absolute altitude record of 85,000 feet. Now, others had exceeded that, but only in an up and down motion. The SR-71 Blackbird flew continuously at an altitude of 85,000 feet with an absolute speed of 2,193 miles an hour. Brian Shull relates in his book that at, he went 3.5 Mach in 1986 briefly. That plane holds a land speed record on a recognized course where it flew from New York to London, a distance of 3,500 miles, flying at 2,908 miles an hour, flew from New York to London in one hour and 54 minutes. One hour and 54 minutes. That's how long it takes to drive from here to Baltimore. Impossible? Yes, it was. Possible now? Then and more. Aircraft cars are being developed today. We have self-driving automobiles. I saw one the other day. I laughed. I thought the guy sitting in there reading a book was at peace until that car decided not to stop one time. It might not be so peaceful anymore. All around us in this world, things are said to be impossible. Things are said that they cannot be done. You cannot swim across the English Channel. You cannot walk across the United States. You cannot go to the moon. You cannot do so many things that for so long were thought impossible. And yes, they were. And around this room are people who are said to be impossible. In this very room are people who were given the love of Jesus Christ that's said by others they don't deserve it. Many people in this room, when you were still a sinner and didn't know Christ, was it impossible for you to understand, for you to comprehend? <laughs> yes, it was. Capital letters, W-A-S. Charles Kettering said, when I was research head of General Motors and I wanted a problem solved, I'd place a table outside the meeting room with a sign that said, leave slide rules here. If I didn't do that, I'd find someone reaching for his slide rule the minute I said I wanted something done saying, boss, it can't be done. It's impossible. And yet we did great things when we left the impossibilities behind. Let me read you two impossible scriptures first. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. 
I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not come yet. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you save the best until now. This is the first of the miraculous signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. We are told it can't be done. We are told that it was impossible. Yes, it was. Martin Luther once read the account of Abraham's offering of Isaac on the altar in Genesis 22. His wife Katie said, I do not believe God would have treated his son like that. But Katie, Luther replied, he did. He did for the greater purpose. And today, well today, the things that we think that are impossible happened. And yet today, the greatest impossibility of all happened. We look at Jesus born of a virgin. Impossible. Impossible in our understanding of how things work. And yet with God, what? All things are possible. He sat at a table, resting quietly. And yet when his mother asked him, the miracles began. He took water and turned it into wine. And not just regular wine, but wine that was beautiful and lovely. Impossible? With God, all things are what? In this scripture that we read this morning, Jesus died on the cross. After he had been flogged, after he had been beat, after he had been smacked in the face, after he had had that nasty crown twisted and stuck on his head, and the Bible makes clear it was not placed, it was driven onto his head. After all of that, made to carry His own cross to a place called the skull. After all of that, our Savior was nailed to it. Raised up on that cross with common thieves and left to die. That's impossible to think about. Yet it happened. And he died. He didn't die because he ran out of oxygen. He didn't die by the way of, uh, of crucifixion went, where he had his legs broken. He died because it was time. His body had endured all that it could endure. And finally, when it was time, he let it go and died. The Bible says, breathed his last. What do we do? People that loved him still so much saw fit to take him down and bury him because that's what we do. We put them at a place where they can rest. That's what we do. No one in that crowd, and I mean no one, 
understood what was about to happen. Linda asked about the rock in front of the tomb. The tombs were set up in such a way and hewn in such a way that once the, the tomb was set open, the rock was put on an elevated platform, a set of ramps that were pointed down and was held in place with stone pins. Typically what would happen is, is if a person that had enough money to have a tomb cut in a rock was buried in the rock, so was much of his valuables. It was set up so that when that rock rolled across, that was it. It would never be moved again. Not without great effort, not without complete destruction. But what do we read? They gave him the body. He buried it. They closed up the tomb as per tradition. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers and the keepers of the law said to Pilate, you know, when he was alive, he said, I'm, I'm going to come back in three days and all of his believers are still with us. We think they're going to try to trick us. Can we go there and do something to that rock that it won't be opened by anybody? And Pilate had the audacity to say, here, take my seal and put it on the rock. You know what the seal is? Wax. Wax. Wax seal. Do you know how good wax keeps the stuff? Imagine that. They went over and they took candles and they blotted wax against it. And they stamped his seal in it when it his seal. And when it cooled, there was a little wax thing that went between the wall and the rock. Wax! With a little seal on it that said, do not open or else. I mean, I don't know what it said in Roman, but that's basically what he said. Do you know what wax is good for holding back? Very little. And I subject you to go to the store the next time you can up here at that Amish market and get you a big old handful of wax Coke's bottles. Those things don't hold the Coke back, do they? Hmm? And then what do you do? You eat the wax. And you walk around going, this is such good stuff. But an earthquake came and moved the rock. Impossible. Yes, it was, but it happened. And an angel came down and sat on it. And Mary and Mary and everyone else that saw him told them, don't look for Jesus here. He rose up just like he said three days later. Look for yourself. And they did. And terrified, they didn't know what to do. And the angel said, go back home. The Bible records the next words as they were going back. Jesus met them. Met them. Walked up to them. Greetings, He said. They came to Him and clasped His feet and worshipped Him. Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell My brothers to go to Galilee. They will see Me there. Today, the most possible ever happened. The most impossible was transformed. And we can be transformed because of believing in the impossible. There is a story that said of a doctor that had a, a dog that liked to stay in his waiting room with him back in the day. And one day a patient was in there getting his diagnosis and it wasn't good. And they began to discuss with one another the hereafter. While they were talking, they heard this scratching at the door. The doctor, a Christian, was trying to explain to the patient what heaven was. And the patient said, it's impossible. And the doctor says, but you hear that dog? He's scratching at the door because he wants in. Not because anything is possible that he knows what's on the other side of this door. As a matter of fact, to a dog it's impossible to know. Except that he hears his master's voice and wants to be wherever he is. The Christian that loves his master, that loves Jesus Christ, hears his call, hears his voice, and believes that with Jesus, with God, all things are as possible as on the day of the resurrection when He lives again. 
Henry Moore said, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the crowning proof of Christianity. If the resurrection did not take place, then Christianity, Christianity is a false religion. If it did take place, then Christ is God and the Christian faith is the absolute truth. I say to you, He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. The impossible happened today. Jesus Christ rose up and walked out of that grave and made Himself known again. A man and his five-year-old son driving past the cemetery and noticed a pile of dirt dug to a, next to a freshly dug grave. And the little boy looked at it and said, Look, Dad, one got out. <laughs> next time you drive past the cemetery, think of the one whom the grave could not hold. Impossible. Yeah. Yes, it was. It was completely impossible that a man that had suffered everything that Jesus Christ did rose from the grave and made it as, as possible and as plausible as these palm trees and lilies and whatever that flower is and I don't know, these beautiful tulips that are here made it as possible to seem that these things would bloom every year Jesus Christ rose on this day. He drove the impossible to the possible, opened up the gates of heaven, and offered and gave salvation to us and to all now until the day He comes back to return us. Happy Resurrection Day. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day. We thank You that we have spent the entire three days dwelling on the impossible. Only to have it culminate today, Father. That it was, it did, it is happening. It is something that we can constantly be in reminding of, in remembrance of, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Today. And all we need to do is call on His name. Give our life to Him. We are saved by that spilt blood, by that sweat from that brow, and by that beautiful, glorious Jesus that walked out of that tomb to show us that life does not end at death. Not if we know Jesus. May we each know Him better today. May we each walk closer with Him today. May we each be held up by Him, Father. In Jesus' name we give thanks. Praise you for making the impossible possible. Amen. As we sing the last hymn, the bench is open, and if you don't know Jesus, today is the day, the very best day. May God be with each and every one of you. We stand.
brothers and sisters today, today, be thankful that the impossible was made possible. Today, brothers and sisters, be thankful that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was resurrected. Believe in it and live that belief and tell that story in the week to come. May God bless each and every one of you. Watch over and keep you now and forevermore. Amen.